Would you bow your heads as you stand? Lord Jesus, as we reflect on your word, we pray your spirit would speak. As your spirit speaks, may we hear. As we hear, may we live. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Please sit down. We're continuing looking at worship and what we do as part of our worship and today looking at the songs we sing. And it's interesting that music is as powerful as it is and we have it throughout our lives um, in all sorts of places. We use music and we hear music. Um, and just think of, of movies and the, the role that the soundtrack plays in emphasizing and enabling the movie to communicate the way it does. And when Daniel was about two or three and we were watching uh, stuff on TV, as the music of the soundtrack changed, he would leave the room because he knew it was going to be a scary part. He could read the music. Um, and that's what it does. And if you ever watch a film without music, it, it's, it's, there's an emptiness to it. And music doesn't only sort of create, uh, convey mood, it also influences us as well. And music can move us in profound ways. And one of my favorite pieces of music is the, the duet of the Pearl Fishers, um, Babize. When sung well, it just there's something that happens. More contemporary, the uh, from the album Times of Freedom, Jeff Beck and Seal do a, a version of Bob Dylan's "Like a Rolling Stone," which is deep and moving. And so it's a little wonder that we have music in the church as part of our our worship. And music in the church can, can play a number of roles. Sometimes it can just be entertaining. And I've watched the start of the service of nine lessons and carols from uh, King's College, Cambridge. And as the service starts and the choir processes in, and there's one of those trebles, a young boy, probably about 11 or 12, singing the opening verse of Once in Royal David City, a kind of, oh, that is really sweet, and how beautiful, and what a, what a lovely um, uh, mood it creates. It's, it's a very pretty thing to, to observe. And it's entertaining. I was at a, 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 a Remembrance Day service at St. John's some years ago, and they're remembering one of the chaplains who'd been in the First World War, and... Uh, earned the Distinguished Service Cross because of the work he'd done at the Somme, going into the no-man's land and rescuing people. And the men all reported that he just walked in. He walked in and got the people, and he never got shot, except for the one day when the, the, the shelling was quite heavy, and he thought he, he wouldn't just walk in, so he tried to creep in, and as he was creeping in, he got shot in his arm um, and lost the use of that arm but what a profound impact he'd had. So we're remembering him and all the others that had died in the war. And at the end of the service, the choir, which was the college choir of boys, plus the old boys choir, so about 80 male voices sang the Russian Kentuckian for the departed. And that was profoundly moving in the context. Music is profound and little wonder but it's kind of odd that we sing because we don't do that in other aspects of society there's very few places where you go and sing unless you're preparing to do a a show you join a choir and you sing preparing to sing in a concert or entertain people but to just sing we seldomly do that but all churches sing. It's part of the, the life of the church. And the, the, it'll vary from what we do to choirs and, and organs to orchestras to singing unaccompanied. 
but all churches sing. And little wonder we do because Scripture tells us that God sings. And in C.S. Lewis's Narnia series, there's that wonderful image in the second book, I think it is, The Magician's Nephew, where Aslan, representing um, God, sings Narnia into being. And there's this description of Aslan singing, and as he sings, the trees and the mountains and everything <coughs> comes into being. God sings. In Zephaniah chapter 3, we're told, <clears throat> The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. God sings over us. God sings. And we're told in Hebrews 2 that Jesus sings as well. From verse 11, the writer says, So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters in the assembly I will sing your praises. Jesus says, I will sing your praises. <clears throat> so God sings. And as a result, his creation sings. And we read of the angels singing in uh, Revelations 5. We're told they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. The angels around the throne of God all sing. And as we sang earlier from Revelations chapter 7, John writes, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hand, they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength. Be to our God forever and ever. Amen. So the angels sing in heaven and we will join them one day. And in the meanwhile, all creation sings. Job 38, uh, God challenging Job and talking about the creation and says, where were you? How do you know? And he says, on what were its footings set looking at the earth? Who marked off its dimensions? Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set? Or who laid its cornerstone while the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy? Isaiah 44, he says, Sing for joy, you heavens, for the Lord has done this. Shout aloud, you earth beneath. Burst into song, you mountains, you forests and all trees. For the Lord has redeemed Jacob. He displays his glory in Israel. So the heavens, the earth, the mountains, the forests, the trees, all burst forth in singing. And as a result, it's no surprise that God's people sing. In the scriptures, we've got recorded 185 songs that people sang. And if you take some of the, the passages which are not explicitly songs, but we assume they were, the number's even greater. And so something like the Song of Mary, the Magnificat, my soul declares the greatness of God, my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. It, we're told Mary said that. It looks like a song, a bit like a song, but it's not explicit that she sang it. We think she probably did. So that's not counted. Apart from those things, 
there's 185 other songs in Scripture. And the first song we have recorded is from the book of Exodus, as the people of Israel had crossed the Red Sea and the Egyptian army had been destroyed. We're told in chapter 15, Then Moses and the Israelites sang this song to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. Both horse and rider he is hurled into the sea. And interestingly, the last song recorded in Scripture is from Revelations chapter 15. And we're told that the, uh, the angels and the white-robed army gathers around, and we're told they held harps given them by God and sang the song of God's servant Moses and of the Lamb. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty, just and true are your ways, King of the nations, who will not fear you, Lord, and bring glory to your name. And so all this, uh, the songs in Scripture are bracketed by a song of Moses at the beginning and a song of Moses and the Lamb at the end in heaven. And as you read through Scripture, the whole of the book of Psalms are songs. That's the songbook of the, the people of Israel. And that was a songbook of of the early church. And in the prophets we have songs as well. <coughs> in Isaiah, uh, he's asked to go and preach to the people and preach to them both judgment and comfort. And one of the mess in one of the messages, he uses a song. And he says, I will sing for the one I love, a song about his vineyard. And he goes on with a prophecy, singing a song. In Ezekiel chapter 32, we're told, In the twelfth year, in the twelfth month of the first day of the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, take up a lament concerning Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Take up the song of mourning and of, of weeping. And a little later in the chapter, we're told this is the lament they will chant for her. The daughters of the nations will chant it for Egypt and all her hordes. They will chant it, declares the sovereign Lord. So Ezekiel has people chanting a lament. And in the New Testament, we have a number of songs as well. Um, Mary's song. Not explicitly in Scripture said it's a song, but it looks like a song. It's very much like a psalm. Mary says, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. Zechariah, the father of John, sings as John is born. and We have the song of Zechariah. As Jesus is born, the angels gather with the shepherds and they sing on the hilltops. And the whole of heaven is filled with a song of glory. As Jesus is taken to the temple, Simeon praises God apparently in song. And Jesus himself sang. In Matthew chapter 26, we're told um, at the end of the, the, the Last Supper, just before they went out, when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Jesus and the disciples at the end of the Passover sang a hymn and went out. And they'd probably done that at every Passover of their lives. Jesus sang. The apostles sang. We have the story of Paul arrested and thrown into the Philippian jail and uh, chained on the inside as the people decide what to do with him. And in verse 25, we read, About midnight, Paul and Silas, both chained up in prison, were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening to them. So there they were, Paul and Silas, singing hymns. Not in church out of joy, but in a prison out of joy. Because God was with them there. 
James tells us, is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. And as we read through the scripture time and again, we're told to sing. Psalm 33 begins, sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. We're told to sing. In Ephesians chapter 5, Paul tells us, sing and make music from your hearts to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Sing and make music from your heart. Now, one of the things that happens as we sing is that God is present in a profound way. Psalm 22, we have um, uh, the psalmist writing, Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. God is enthroned on the praises of his people. And as we sing to God, he comes and is enthroned on our praise. So as we sing, how do we sing? Scripture also gives us a couple of indications there. We're told we are to sing joyfully. We're told to sing praises. Psalm 57 tells us, sing and make music. Psalm 65 says, shout for joy and sing. Psalm 81 says, sing for joy to God our strength. Shout aloud to the God of Jacob. I was told, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. So we call to sing joyfully, to shout, to sing new songs. And Paul says to the Corinthians, I will pray with my spirit, but I will also pray with my understanding. I will sing with my spirit, but I will also sing with my understanding. And so a lot of our songs will have a content that we can apply our minds to and that can feed our spirits. <coughs> In Chronicles, we're told that the Levites gathered and they sang with a very loud voice. Psalm 98 says, Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Burst into jubilant song with music. Psalm 150 uh, highlights the, the variety in the, the accompaniment to our singing. Praise God. In his sanctuary, praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and lyre. Praise him with timbrel and dancing. Praise him with the strings and pipe. Praise him with a clash of cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And as we read through Scripture, I also find it interesting what Scripture does not say. In the Psalms, tunes are mentioned a number of times. And so at the beginning of Psalm 22, usually in the superscript before the Psalm starts at, um, at, itself, and we're told in Psalm 22, um, for the director of music, to the tune of the Doe of the Morning, a psalm of David. And so that mentions tunes a number of times. It doesn't mention singing tunefully. <laughs> I looked up harmony in the Bible, and that occurs a number of times. But harmony is always about peaceful relationships. Live in harmony with one another. It is never mentioned in terms of music. There is nothing in scripture about singing tunefully, beautifully, harmoniously. 
We think it's important, not scripture. When Samuel is looking for a king and he sees David's brothers and then David comes, God says to him, the Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance. The Lord looks at the heart. And if he looks at people like that, he would listen to our singing like that as well. And there are a number of people that have been blessed with wonderful voices. And there are a number of Christian artists that are, uh, are um, sing wonderfully well. And you think of people like Amy Grant and Michael W. Smith, C.C. Winans, David Crowder. And if you go back in time, Thomas Dooley, um, Sister Rosetta Thorpe, Hank Williams. Um, and for those from that era, even Elvis Presley would sing. And you have a group like the Gaithers singing beautiful songs. Um, to my envy, um, when I was at school, primary school sometime, came out of church and my mother mentioned how badly I sang. <laughs> so I'd come and stick with one. <laughs> and she, she said, um, you, when you're singing with the radio and singing pop songs, you sing okay, but in church you, you lose it. Um, and I never actually got it. And when I was at uh, school and they were auditioning for the choir, the choir master worked, walked past people, getting you to sing notes, and I was one of the people that he walked past quite quickly. Um, <laughs> and it's something I've sort of pondered. And we need to remember that God made us as we are. And God gave us the voices we have. And God, whether it was just my imagination, but I think God said to me, if I'd wanted you to sing like Josh Groban, you'd sing like Josh Groban, but I don't want you to sing like that. <laughs> so I don't. <laughs> <laughs> And if you can just imagine the best Christian voices singing as they sing, and it's beautiful and it moves us. And then think of the worst Christian voices as they sing. And if you've been in the church for more than a little while, you'll have heard a number of them. Um, and when I was in Pretoria, we had a couple of people that were part of the congregation, a man called Bill and another called Johnny, they really could not sing, <laughs> but they did, and they were joyful, and they were exalting God, and which is God more pleased with, the beautiful singing or the heartfelt song. And I believe that what Bill and John and those other people, and we all know them, what they sing with enthusiasm and praise to God is far more precious in God's sight than the most beautiful, most harmonious, most amazing song. God looks at our hearts as we sing. It doesn't matter how we sing. It matters that we sing. And in that scripture of the, uh, Jesus feeding the 5,000, there was this impossible task that they faced. And he said to the disciples, what do we do? They had no idea. And Andrew comes along and says, he has a young boy, but he's only got five loaves and two fish. That's, what good is that amongst all of this? We haven't got the resources to meet the need. But the young boy gave his five loaves and his two fish anyway. And God took that little that he gave and multiplied it and met the need. As we come to God in worship, as we come to God in song, we offer what we have 
God doesn't expect us to offer what we don't have. We offer what we have to God. And he inhabits the praises of his people. So as we sing, what do we sing? We sing uh, with the truths of God from Scripture. In the reading from Colossians, Paul says, Let the message of Christ, the message that Christ brought, the message about Christ, let it dwell among you as you teach and admonish one another. So our, our songs will often have a, the truths of the Scripture in them. And if you look at the words that we sing of the, the, the hymns and the songs, they're rich in scriptural themes and, and theology. And those are the kind of things that if you are one day locked up in a, in a prison in solitary confinement for being a Christian, if you can sing those songs, your faith will be strong because the truths of the gospel are proclaimed in them. Some of the songs we sing are our response to the truth. We would say, I love you, Lord, because of what you've done. I worship you. And we sing our response. And as we sing, we sing to God. And we also sing to one another. Paul says, teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. And we do this through psalms and hymns and songs of the Spirit. What the difference between psalms and hymns and songs of the Spirit are, we're not quite sure. There's a lot of debate about it. But the point is we are singing to other Christians. And we're teaching and admonishing them. We're pointing them to the truth as we teach. We're encouraging them as we admonish and other people. And as we sing and we encourage one another, we build people up. And the worship can minister to people in profound ways. And as we bring our voices together, we're, minister, we're praising God, we're enthroning God, and we're ministering to each other. One writer said, when our voices blend together in corporate singing, we declare our dependence, our gratitude, and praise to the Lord. At times we grieve, and at times we celebrate before him. But we also sing to the family in front of us, to the single person behind us, to the couple on the other side of the room. All of us, the bewildered parents, the addicts, the restless children, the weary pastors, cancer patients, teenagers fighting for purity, we sing to each other. We remind one another of the gospel and our shared hope in Christ. We exhort one another to believe and trust. Amen.